right, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Em. I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library, and we're thrilled to be hosting tonight's main author talk. Uh, I want to start the night off with a couple quick programming notes on upcoming events at the library. Uh, next week on August 5th, we'll have a screening of the film Peer Kids from POV by PBS about queer and trans youth in New York City. Um, that will be held both in the community room of the library and has an option to join via Zoom. Um, and the following week, we'll be hosting a poetry event in collaboration with the Maine Humanities Council on the library lawn with local poets exploring Rockland's community through poetry. Um, and I am happy to introduce tonight's speaker. Robin Clifford Wood is an author, poet, blogger, and essayist. She has a BA from Yale, an MA in English from University of Rochester, and an MFA in creative writing from University of Southern Maine's Stone Coast program. Her writing has been featured in numerous publications. One of her poems won second place in the 2020 Writers Digest annual competition, and another, The Ballad of Hadlock, The Seal Hunter Showman, was produced by Penobscot Theater Company as part of their fall 2020 audio theater program. Wood lives in central Maine with her husband and dogs. She enjoys being active outdoors, playing the piano, crossword puzzles, a really good cheeseburger, and regular visits with her four children and their growing families. And I will turn it over to Robin. Go right ahead. All right. Thank you so much, M, and thank you to Rockland Library for hosting this event. And, um, and, and man, many thanks to um, all of you who have joined me today on this, uh, on the occasion of celebrating um, this wonderful book that uh, just was released on May 4th of this year. And, um, and it's been quite a whirlwind um, sharing this book that I've worked on for 13 years um, to bring to, bring to, uh, to life. Um, it began as a, um, a spark of an idea to write a magazine article and, um, and then it grew into this full length book project. So I think I'm gonna start, you got a little background on me um, and what I'd like to then give you is a little background on Rachel Field, the subject of my biography. The reason why um, I started writing this book um, was because I moved into a house on Sutton Island, which is one of the Cranberry Isles um, off of Mount Desert Island in Maine. And um, we bought the house that used to belong to this this famous writer. And I didn't really know anything at all about Rachel Field when we first moved into this place. My husband's family had been going to Sutton Island for years and years. And, um, and so I had, I had been going since I met my husband in 1979. But in 1994, we first walked onto the, um, the, up onto the rotting floorboards of this long neglected house, which had been sitting empty for about eight years. And that was quite unusual. There are only about 25 houses, 26 houses on this island. It's a mile long and a half mile wide. There are no roads, no community property. It's all private property, no year round population. So you lug all your stuff by wheelbarrow or backpack from the, the dock where the mail boat, the fuel, fuel, uh, ferry boat drops you off. Um, and uh, as a result, when people sell their houses on this island, they tend to leave all their things behind. So a lot of stuff that even predated Rachel was still in the house when we, um, when we viewed it and when we bought it um, and it was sold as is. So um, we moved into this place and I was surrounded by Rachel's things. Um, I think what, I, what I'd like to do is maybe read the first two pages of the prologue because that gives a pretty good introduction. Um, a lot of what I've, I've been starting to tell you now. In 1994, my husband and I purchased a long abandoned wood frame house on an island off the coast of Maine. In the 1920s and 30s, it had been the summer house of author Rachel Field on the island that inspired all her most successful work, the poetry, plays, children's books, and novels that took her from struggling writer to Newbery medalist, National Book Award winner, then rising Hollywood success. At the peak of her renown, she died suddenly and unexpectedly, leaving so many stories untold, including her own. When I first walked into the island home that had been her magical place, her muse, 
Some of those stories reached out tendrils, looking for a place to attach themselves. I felt their presence in the flutters of my heart, but didn't know at the time what it meant. Many people know the sensation of entering an old house and feeling something of its history in the air. It whispers from the corners, buzzes indecipherably in the motes of dust illuminated by a ray of sunlight through wavy glass. The building retains some indefinable quality left behind by its former inhabitants, some of their energy lingering in the atmosphere. On an island with no roads, only footpaths and wooden wheelbarrows, the leavings of former inhabitants are not just figurative. Rachel's weighty wooden sleigh bed is still there in the room where she slept. The old wicker chairs in front of the fireplace creak under my weight as they creaked under hers. Her Scotty dog trinkets and paraphernalia wait expectantly, pointy ears on alert, on shelves and in drawers. I sit on the front porch, the covered piazza as Rachel called it, and I contemplate the same view of Seal Harbor and Acadia National Park's rocky top mountains across an expanse of sea called the Eastern Way. That same view inspired Rachel's creative work, her joy and her loneliness. Rachel's life was not easy. It was not all fairy houses and moon glow or silver streaks of rain on city streets or soaring gulls alighting gracefully on the barnacled rocks of an island off the coast of Maine, even though her work is alive with all those wonders. It wasn't a life of deep deprivation either. Her family had enough means to get by and the social status to be accepted into most echelons of the stratified society of her era. The difficulties in Rachel's life were more situational and internal. First, there was her physical presence. Many who knew her effervescent spirit on the page were shocked to meet Rachel for the first time, for she was not the elfin sprite they expected, but a woman of imposing stature and heavy masculine features. Her warmth quickly eclipsed superficial impressions. She had a lightness about her, something open and engaging that made people feel like an old friend at her kitchen table. Nonetheless, her exterior self caused her a lifetime of rue. I also sensed that her story was weighty with much deeper disappointments, even before I'd begun my research. There were shadows of loss, heartbreak, secrecy, a sister gone mad, an improper marriage, infertility, a child who seemed to disappear, so many unanswered questions. But Rachel's story, I was certain, held more than anything, a prodigious share of redemption and hopefulness. I was certain not only because of Rachel's work, but because I inhabited her space. So that, that's, a, that's a good way to give you a general inter introduction to my, my earliest connections with Rachel Field and, um, and this house that we shared. Um, Rachel Field, I'll, I'll play a little show and tell with you guys. Um, she, her first big hit was this book, Hitty, Her First Hundred Years. She was the first woman to win the Newbery Award and it was with this book um, illustrated by Dorothy Lathrop. And I had the great pleasure the other day of um, do, giving a book talk in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where the original Hitty doll, who's only about six inches tall, um, is under glass in, um, in a little doll miniature setting. Um, and she was the doll that sat on the mantelpiece in the house that Rachel Field and I share. Um, and she sat there in 1928 with Rachel Field and Dorothy Lathrop and a friend of theirs and went while they were brainstorming the hundred year adventures of Hitty the little doll. Um, and that became her famous Newbery winner. Um, and then the, she won the National Book Award with this book, Time Out of Mind, which I believe is set right near where you where, where Rockland Library is. I'm not sure if, if you guys attending are from Rockland or not, um, but it's set, set in mid coast Maine at the time that uh, wooden ships were beginning to become obsolete. Um, what else do I have for you? And then she also posthumously won a Caldecott Award for Prayer for a Child. This is, this is one of her uh, books that's actually still, still in print and you can still find that one. But she's, she wrote something like 32 books in, in the, uh, during the, the career that was so sadly cut short. Um, she was a, a, an a incredibly hard worker and, uh, and a prolific writer. 
Um, but when I first moved into the house, these, these mysteries um, began to, to pop up and pique my interest. I, um, I started researching at the Great Cranberry Island Historical Society, where there were some huge hitty fans that started the threads that I followed all over the country to find out uh, what, what was it that she actually died of? And did, if she did have a child, what happened to that child? Where did she go? Um, and, uh, and I started reading her poetry and I, I adore her poetry. She had this incredible lightness of spirit, but there was also, there's also wisdom and there's also universal experiences. And uh, one of the things in her poetry that especially appealed to me um, was this sense of a disconnect between your exterior self and your interior self. Um, and many, many people can relate to this. And there was just a woman in the, in the audience last night uh, and when I was in Sorrento who said this, this po particular poem moved her very deeply. And this was anthologized in many poetry collections um, throughout the 20th century. My inside self and my outside self are different as can be. My outside self wears gingham smocks and very round is she with freckles sprinkled on her nose and smoothly parted hair and clumsy feet that cannot dance in heavy shoes and square. But oh, my little inside self in gown of misty rose, she dances lighter than a leaf on blithe and twinkling toes. Her hair is blowing gold. And if you chanced her face to see, you would not think she could belong to staid and sober me. Um, and here's another one, just you know, another example of this uh, disconnect between the person who we are on the inside and the person that the world sees on the outside. This is called The Quiet Child. And again, I, 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 this was anthologized. By day, it's a very good girl am I. I sit by the fire and sew. I darn the stockings and sweep the floors and hang the pots in a row. But oh, by night when the candle's out and my bedroom black as pitch, I've just to crackle my thumbs to turn into a wild bad witch. Nights of storm and nights of stars are all the same to me. It's up on my broom and straddle the wind as it whips my pigtails free. Over the chimney pots to go past the jumbled lights of towns with the hosts of good black trees beyond and dim sheep sprinkled downs. No one knows when morning comes and I'm back in bed once more with tangled hair and eyes a blink from the sunshine on the floor. No one knows of that witch who rode in the windy dark and wild. And I let them praise my sober ways and call me a quiet child. So it was uh, qualities like that that started to intrigue me um, about Rachel Field, the person, and not just um, Rachel, Rachel Field's work. And so I started digging around to find out more about this, uh, this woman who shared this house with me. I, I felt a resonance with her right from the start. And, um, and my archival search, I, well, I'll tell you something. It felt, it felt like something that, um, that wouldn't let me go after a while. And I, and I began to wonder if, um, you know, if some unknown powers were leading me into this whole project from the beginning. Um, there were just so many coincidences that, that drew me along. I, I, Rachel Field and I shared a lot of things. Um, we had big differences in our lives too, certainly, but um, I, I uh, fell in love with this main island first in my teens, just as Rachel Field did. In fact, I was, another thing I wanted to read to you was Rachel's description of first arriving on Sutton Island. And I feel like this might have, uh, you know, this, this might resonate with some of you guys too, who, um, who maybe, maybe have fallen in love with Maine yourselves. This is the beginning of chapter four called If Once You Have Slept on an Island. No one knew, least of all Rachel herself, how her life would be altered by her introduction to the Maine coast. From the year that I was 15, Rachel wrote in 1934, I have been going each summer to a small, beautiful, wooded island off the coast of Maine. And I suppose that it, 
more than any other one thing in my life has helped me with my writing. For it means roots and background to me. It creeps into nearly everything I write and I never want to be anywhere else when summer comes round. Roots and background were essential forces throughout Rachel's life, but the roots and background of her Stockbridge ancestry faded out of sight once she discovered Maine. And here's a quote from a Rachel Field letter. One doesn't have to be born in a place to have roots there. I think one root struck down into Maine soil on my first visit to the state. It was when I was 15 years old, the most impressionable age. I shall never forget how I was stirred by my first view of the Maine coast coming into Rockland in the early morning light. I felt an uplift as at no other place in the firs pointing skyward, the glisten all around me, the old ships from distant ports at the wharves, these things still stir me. So I found passages like that as I began visiting archive collections um, all around the country. Now I, I was, I think I, I would call myself still a, uh, a burgeoning writer at this time. I felt this call to write from childhood um, as did Rachel Field. Uh, but the other thing both Rachel and I shared was a, was a very powerful call to motherhood. Um, and in my case, motherhood um, held sway over much of my adult life. I raised four children um, and I did it full time pretty much for about 25 years. Rachel Field was a writer. And back in her day when she was growing up in the 20s and 30s, it was not, um, not considered uh, possible or, or acceptable for a woman to be a professional and to be a wife and mother. So she and many of the women colleagues she chose to be with when she, she lived um, eight months of her life in New York City and four months a year in, uh, in, on Sutton Island. These were women who were the first editors of um, departments in big publishing companies. These were the head of the New York Public Library. These were big, big names in, um, in publishing. Um, but virtually all of these women remained unmarried and certainly remained uh, uh, not, you know, not with children. So it just, you know, it was, it was almost like um, you had to choose one or the other back in that day and age. Um, and she finally married at age 40. Um, and she was kind of a pedigreed woman. She had an aristocratic background and it was considered an, you know, a, a, not a highly um, admirable marriage because she married a Broadway actor. So there was all this hoopla about that. She wrote in letters, you know, people keep asking me, are you sure until I wanna throw up my hands. So um, that was one of the things I was digging into as I was trying to figure out some of the stories behind this, this life that began to intrigue me so. Um, and then Rachel um, longed to have children and uh, unsuccessfully for a very long time. So she did in fact struggle with infertility. And I was able to find that out because there were incredible um, collections of letters in Washington DC and in, uh, at the Vassar College Library where one of her editors had a, a lot of late Rachel Field paraphernalia um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And interestingly, um, because motherhood was really my primary occupation during those years, um, all of those collections that popped up about Rachel Field um, conveniently fit in with places where my children were. They brought me together with my family. I had children living in Cambridge when I had to go do this work in Cambridge, studying the stuff at Radcliffe Library. I had a son living in Washington DC and got to stay with him when I went to the Library of Congress. Um, I, my, my mother who went to Vassar College, I had never been to Vassar with her and I didn't get to spend much time with her. And um, because there was a big collection of Rachel Field stuff in Vassar, um, my mother spent a day with me being my research assistant and I got to visit her alma mater with her for the first time in my life and spend time with her. My daughter played softball in college and happened to have this one spring break in California and they invited all their parents to come along. Um, and that's when I got to go study Rachel Field's California years because I, I was flying to California anyway 
So there, there was my opportunity <coughs> to study, uh, to visit Rachel Fields California homes, to go to the MGM library and the Academy library, and, um, and even uh, the hospital where Rachel died. And, um, and I got to meet with a retired doctor who was writing a history of the hospital. Um, and after I finagled a, um, a letter from a distant field family relative, because Rachel had no descendants herself, um, he allowed me to look at her medical records in this giant old leather book with spidery handwriting written inside and, um, and let me read the passages um, that talked about Rachel's cause of death. So there were lots of things that came to me um, and uh, without, without getting in the way of me being a mom. And um, uh, so it just, uh, it just felt like um, something was making this easier for me as I, as I went along. And I really did try to put this project away on, on numerous occasions because it just, it felt too hard. I thought it was gonna take me a year and it took me nine, nine years of research and writing and then another four to go through the whole publication process. So it, it was a really big deal. And I, if I'd known that when I started, I may never have started, um, but there I was and I'd, I'd put it away for six months and then I'd get a phone call from someone who had a new Rachel Field collection or I'd get, a, or I'd get an email from someone who said, oh, I, I, saw, I hear you're, you know about Rachel Field. Can you tell me about copyrights about this particular poem? Or someone wanted me to read Rachel Field poetry on top of Cadillac Mountain for a, for a poetry day in Maine. And um, it, just, it just happened time and again. Um, it was like the project wouldn't let me put it aside. Um, let's see. Um, if you guys, by the way, if any of you have questions along the way, or if you feel like I, I dropped a thread and you want to hear the end of it, I'm very happy to, um, M said she would take a look at questions along the way, and I do not mind introduct, um, interruptions. I'm happy to take a, a tangent and answer a question if it's a burning question about something. Okay, so here I'm going to tell you, um, I know what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to take a quick break. And I would like to share with you guys um, some pictures. I've got some slides of Sutton Island and, um, and I thought it might be nice if you guys got a little view of, uh, of what this place is all about. So can you see that? Is that working, M? Are we, are we good? Can't. Um, None of you is uh, has your video on, so I can't tell if um, if you're seeing these pictures or not. Yep, looks good to me. Okay, thank you. All right, so here is the view off our front porch, looking back at um, Cadillac and Pematic Mountains, and I think that's Sergeant off to the left, if I'm correct. And here's a picture of the house. It's kind of a a uh, collection of collection of shingled buildings. And there is a view from just down in front of the house. That's uh, that lovely October light. Um, and that is a, at sunrise. We're looking north at Mount Desert Island, by the way. Um, and off to our right is the sun, sunrise. And there's uh, one of our dogs, Clara, and my husband sitting in, uh, in the front porch. Here is um, one of those Scotty dog paraphernalia items that I found in drawers. All these found cocktail napkins with Scotties on them and a candle snuffer with a little metal Scotty figurine on top and uh, ashtrays with Scotty dogs. So, um, and here is uh, Rachel Field's initials, Rachel Lyman Field embroidered into a dish towel that was just in a drawer in the kitchen pantry. That key, um, there's an illustration. Rachel Field also did a lot of her own illustrations. I'll show you some of those shortly. And she um, wrote about this very key. She used to call this house the playhouse, I think because um, in her, her earliest days before she became um, you know, started making a living as a writer. The, her first big break was with plays. She wrote a lot of plays. And um, 
So she called this house the Playhouse after she bought it. Um, and there's the, the key that we used for the first 10 years we lived in the house. So there were all kinds of things like that. There were, her magazines were in the attic. I found the galley proofs for one of her books of poetry in a, in a bedroom drawer. Um, just so many things. There's the wooden sleigh bed that I mentioned earlier. And um, that's where Rachel Field slept. And that's my little cousin some years ago. Um, and that's his sister sitting on the shore. And um, this was another really interesting thing. My, my, that's my children and some of their cousins and island friends. A cup, for a couple of summers, they put plays on in the middle of the woods and invited islanders to come and watch their shows. And later on, as I was researching Rachel's life, I found out that she also put on, she directed a play um, that a bunch of island children acted in. In fact, she had to step in at the last minute as an understudy because someone got sick. Um, and uh, so Rachel and I both, um, both had, had children in plays on Sutton Island too. Lots of parallels. And here she is with her first Scotty dog named Spriggan. It was probably about 1929, I'm guessing, maybe 1930. And there's an older picture of the house. Um, the shore path used to go across in front. And so that long fence line is no longer there. But it doesn't look, and there's her Newberry Medal in the collection in Radcliffe. Um, and this is an interesting, I, I like to share these, this picture of her um, handwriting, which I, you know, among the things that I fell in love with was Rachel's handwriting. It's just very expressive with these big swooping loops and swirls. She often, um, this is not an example of it here, but she often wrote these in tiny print along the edges of the margins to squeeze in her last thoughts and um, this describes when she first bought the field house, July 14th, 1922. Um, let's see, she says, um, as Elizabeth undoubtedly told you, I am being a most foolhardy creature this summer, not only buying this bungalow here where we have been so many summers, but also parting company with my movie job. She was writing synopses of movies for a company in New York City. All goes merrily for the present, but occasionally I do take thought for the morrow, or rather next winter, when I shall probably join the ranks of Highland's breadline, or take up my stand by the public library lions with a tin cup in my hand. I wish I could have had, I wish I could have a hand organ and monkey, but you know that New York generally forbids the latter. So I, I just enjoyed that. And Rachel was a prolific letter writer. And so you'd think someone who is a writer by day wouldn't be writing so many letters, but that's uh, one of the things about her that kind of blew my mind was, the, um, was how many letters she wrote. Um, and that brings me to, to an, another story I wanted to share with you. Um, before I leave behind these, these odd coincidences that kept drawing me back into the story, I, I wanna tell you this last one. Um, in, uh, you know, when, when I, put this book away, the whole project, it was another one of those times I had just, it had been months, I'd put the, the whole project out of my mind and out of my space. And um, I was planning to drive my daughter, my youngest daughter um, transferred to Tulane. Um, and uh, so we were going to drive to New Orleans for the first time. And, um, and I had a couple of weeks before we departed and there was a lull in my summertime and I thought, well, I'll pull out my, my notes once again. There is a 1928 Wanamaker's Diary on the shelves of the field house. And if you don't know what Wanamaker's Diary is, it's an old, it's an old catalog and catalogs sometimes came in these hardcover books. So they were, it's full of advertisements, but it also has blank pages, blank cal calendar pages for making notes for doing journal diary entries. Um, on the, the days of the journal. And um, Rachel's mother had written entries in August of 1928 about someone named Lyle. It said, Rachel and Lyle, all devotion. She has an almost maternal care of him. Rachel and Lyle have gone to the, do the marketing today. And, um, and I, 
I wondered who this Lyle was because he sounded like a love interest, but the man she married was named Arthur, the man she married when she was 40. Um, and I, I knew very little about Rachel's love life. I found nothing whatsoever about it. And um, in one of her poetry collections called Fear is the Thorn is, is filled with these just intensely passionate um, heartbreak and nothing I found about her relationship with Arthur fit these poems at all. So I, I really, I, I just wanted to find out who this person could be. So when I opened my notes again there, I stumbled upon the name Lyle Saxon. Lyle Saxon was a writer, contemporary with Rachel. And he did, um, I found out he, he did live in New York City briefly. Um, and it was right around the time Rachel Field lived there. So uh, thanks to the internet, which uh, this could never have happened without the internet. Um, I was in contact with Rachel Field's biographers in half a day. And the first one said, oh, that's personal life stuff. So ask the other one. I went to her and Chance Harvey said, I can't believe you live in Rachel Field's house. I almost wrote a biography about her myself because I read these 30 letters that are the most incredible letters I've ever read in my life. And they're hand illustrated and filled with just the most beautiful writing I've ever seen. And I, and I just, my heart was pounding. It's like, oh my gosh, that it was like one of those um, treasure hunt moments where you have a, a huge find. And I said, where can I see those letters? Where are those letters? And she said, they're in the archive at Tulane University. So there I was two weeks from being in Tulane University with my daughter. And we drove down shortly thereafter, met with this biographer in the collection in the Louisiana Research Library at Tulane and um, spent a day or two with, with my daughter as my research assistant, assistant um, reading these, these fabulous, marvelous letters. And that, that was um, really opened um, one of the last remaining big mysteries that I had been um, struggling to figure out. Um, Okay, and there's Rachel Field on her, uh, on Sutton Island, once again. Um, there's me with my dog. Sorry, I'm just gonna skip on through because I don't wanna run out of time here. There's, those are my four kids. We did a lot of reading out there and I think that's my husband in the background, yeah. And there they all are uh, more grown with in-laws and dogs added to the bunch. And I really felt um, that perhaps um, over time I had, I'll tell you, I, I worried when I was writing this book, I worried that maybe, I'm gonna stop sharing just for a little bit. I'm not sure if I'll come back here or not. But I worried a little bit that maybe I was revealing stuff Rachel wouldn't want revealed or you know, or just maybe I should let sleeping dogs lie, but I couldn't figure out why no one had ever written this biography. In fact, during my, uh, during my project, I found letters from one of Rachel's best friends that traced her progress through the writing of a full length biography about Rachel Field. It was, it was a children's version of a biography, but she said, now I'm writing her college years. Now I'm writing her California years. Now I'm doing this. And, um, and now I've sent it off to Rand McNally publishers. And then suddenly it was gone. And I, and I, I never found a trace of that book anywhere. And I thought, what happened? Um, and my, my conclusion was that, um, Rachel's death was such a tragedy. It was so unexpected. And um, I, if you haven't read the book yet, I don't want to give a spoiler, but there were, there was kind of tragedy upon tragedy. She, she did, what I will tell you is she did eventually adopt a little girl and her life was complete. It was, you know, they, they were, they were in love with this child and everything was going great. Um, and sadly, um, her daughter was only two when Rachel died. So she had a very short lived opportunity to, um, to enjoy this motherhood she had aspired to for so many years. So um, I, I went through many years of struggling over the idea of telling her story um, and making sure that it was because I wanted to bring Rachel back to life and I didn't want to 
I, I wanted this to be for Rachel. This was like, it felt like a gift I was giving back to her. Um, and what I realized, an, another thing I, I decided in the end, I felt, um, I felt Rachel's support. I felt like maybe this, you know, whatever it is that's pulling me through this project, um, maybe is doing it for a reason. And, and maybe the fact that I had all these children and filled the field house, filled Rachel's treasured island home with children um, might've been exactly what she had hoped for herself um, and never seen come to light. And what I feel like Rachel gave back to me was so many things. I, I Studying her life um, inspired me to work on my writing more. I, it was because of Rachel I got my first magazine article. It was because of Rachel I, I got invited to be a speaker in so many places. And of course, she is responsible for my, my first book. Um, she opened up my writing life um, and, and helped me embrace it as I never had before. So this really felt like a, a mutually beneficial friendship. So, um, so bringing my kids onto the island, um, felt like part of my, my gift to Rachel. Um, so, you know, the, the whole, the, the whole interaction just began to feel um, very powerful in my life um, as, as time went along. Um, let's see, I think I might've had one other thing I wanted to read for you before I leave the reading behind. Um, so um, the format of this book, I hadn't told you about yet. The reason why this turned into a biography memoir hybrid was because um, whenever I started giving talks about Rachel Field, as I did in Stockbridge, Mass, and Tampa, Florida, and, and all around Maine, um, the thing that made people sit up and take notice and start uh, getting excited was when I talked about these connections between Rachel and me and the sharing of the house and the and the odd coincidences and how how she really transformed my writing life um, as I was bringing her life back to the world. She just was such a delightful person. She was so optimistic and full of joy and I couldn't stand the idea that she that she'd been kind of buried in tragedy. Um, so so that was what everyone kept telling me, you need to tell your story too. And I resisted it for the longest time because I, I thought this is Rachel's story. I don't even wanna use the first person when I write this. Um, but then I went to a writer's conference on Campobello Island, it's called the IOTA Short Prose Conference. And the faculty, uh, the faculty leader in this workshop I was in named Dinty Moore, which is a very interesting name. He was, he's a fabulous writer and a fabulous writing teacher. Um, he gave this writing prompt. He said, write a letter to someone who will never read it. And, um, and I just had this inspiration to write Rachel Field. And um, that was the first time I started writing a letter to Rachel Field. It was a really cool idea, I thought. And um, that was the germ of the idea that led to the, um, the memoir part of this book. Because what I ended up doing is uh, writing, I think it'll, it turns into 19 letters to Rachel Field. There's a letter that precedes each chapter. And my letters to Rachel um, trace the arc of a whole different story, of my story of discovering Rachel Field, discovering myself as a writer, falling in love with my, my subject and forging this friendship with, with someone I never got to meet face to face. So I'm gonna read you just the beginning of, of an example of one of these letters. Dear Rachel, 14 years after my first summer in your house, I began to get serious about getting to know you. It helped that I had become a year round resident of the state of Maine. If you were working on getting my attention all that time, I apologize for taking so long to get around to the job. I have grown attached to the state of Maine just as you did it is a place that loves its artists and writers. And I slowly, painstakingly slowly, found a place of belonging here as a writer. It was largely because of you that I finally broke into writing with conviction in the spring of 2008. 
when I bravely pitched an idea for a magazine feature to an editor at a writer's workshop in Southern Maine. I told her about sharing a house with a famous Maine writer from long ago, and she was intrigued. That summer, I got the assignment to write the story for Port City Life magazine. I began researching in earnest for the article that would come out the following summer. I feel strange talking to you about what I read in your letters and journals. There are times when I wonder if I might know you better now than anyone ever knew you in life, because I read your childhood journals, your college letters, and all the stories of your evolving adult womanhood all at once. I got to spread the entire timeline of your life before me and study it. I unearthed secret chapters and put them together with the unexplained non-secret parts and tried to figure out how everything fit. But I won't go into all that just now. So there's an example of one of the letters. Um, um, and I would like to, to play you something. Um, and I'm gonna screen share again here because uh, one of the greatest gifts that I got from a man named Bruce Comuson was Rachel's voice. Um, because, uh, oh, and, and here's, I'm gonna sort this out here, let's see. He sent me a recording of Rachel Field um, on a radio show called Rise and Recite and, and where celebrities come on and they recite some famous poem. It was not her own poem. And, um, and then there's some kind of a competition. But so this is the segment where Rachel reads her poem. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share my screen again. And uh, I'm gonna, I'd like to, to have Rachel up here on the screen while you listen to, um, while you listen to this recording. Now, we have another star graduate of the Little Red Schoolhouse, one of our girls who has written one of the country's best-selling novels. I'm sure you've all read All This and Heaven Too. If you haven't, you ought to because it's a great book. It's written by Rachel Field. Come right up here, Rachel. Good evening, my dear. We're all mighty proud of you, Rachel. Imagine you being a great writer, little Rachel Field who was always getting ink on her fingers. <laughs> Did, so, didn't you used to wear your hair long down your back when you were in school, or was it in pigtails? Oh, I wore them in two pigtails down my back. Uh, well, they used to get the ink inkwells on the desk in back of me. Oh, yes, I know. Well, you grew up to be a mighty good-looking woman, Rachel, and I wish all our scholars turned out so smart. I declare I talked to one of our boys a week or two ago, and he didn't know any more than he did when he was in the fifth grade. I asked him some questions about literature. And my goodness, was, I guess they're going to make a moving picture out of your novel, uh, Rachel, I think. Uh, yes, it goes into production this summer. Mm -hmm. You're going to write it for the movies yourself? No, no, I'm working on a new novel. Oh, I see. Well, you ought to try writing for the movies, Rachel. One of our boys is doing that very thing, and he's just started at it. He's doing pretty well. In fact, he's ahead of the game. He sent in two manuscripts to Hollywood, and they've already sent him back five. <laughs> well, I understand our favorite recitation, or your favorite recitation, is that beautiful poem by Eugene Field, one that is uh, beloved by all children from six to 60, called A Dutch Lullaby. Yes. That's its proper title, though many people call it Winkin', Blinkin', and Nod. And I think that calls for a little music in back of it, don't you, Rachel? Yes, I, I do. Winkin', Blinkin', and Nod one night, and Blinkin', sailed off in a wooden shoe, sailed on a river of crystal light, into a sea of dew. Where are you going and what do you wish? The old moon asked the three. We've come to fish for the herring fish that live in this beautiful sea. Nets of silver and gold had we, said Winkin, Blinkin, and Nod. The old moon laughed and sang a song as they rocked in the wooden shoe. And the wind that sped them all night long ruffled the waves of dew. The little stars were the herring fish that lived in that beautiful sea. Now cast your nets wherever you wish, but never afeard are we. So cried the stars to the fishermen three, Winkin, Blinkin, and Nod. All night long their nets they threw for the stars in the twinkling foam. Then down from the sky came the wooden shoe, bringing the fishermen home. It was all so pretty a sail, it seemed as if it could not be. And some folk thought it was a dream they dreamed of sailing that beautiful sea. But shall I name you the fishermen three? Winkin', Blinkin', 
and Nod. Winken and Blinken are two little eyes, and Nod is a little head. And the wooden shoe that sails the skies is a wee one's trundle bed. So shut your eyes while Mother sings of the wonderful sights that be. And you shall see the beautiful things as you rock on the misty sea, where the old shoe rocked the fishermen three. Winken, Blinken, and Nod. I never get tired of listening to that because her voice just enchants me. And I, I gather I'm not alone as it was quite a, quite a beautiful musical voice. And she did a lot of performing as a child um, and then lots of public speaking as an adult. Um, so I wanna finish by sharing with you a poem. Some of you may well know because this is a popular poem for anyone who lives by the sea or, or likes islands. And it was the first thing I was familiar with that was written by Rachel Field. I think every Sutton Island home has a copy on their, on the walls of their homes. But it feels um, especially relevant and important um, to me um, in terms of my relationship with Rachel Field. If once you have slept on an island, you'll never be quite the same. You may look as you looked the day before and go by the same old name. You may bustle about in street and shop. You may sit at home and sew, but you'll see blue water and wheeling gulls wherever your feet may go. You may talk to your neighbors of this and that and close to your fire keep, but you'll hear ship whistle and lighthouse bell and tides beat through your sleep. Oh, you won't know why and you can't say how such change upon you came, but once you have slept on an island, you'll never be quite the same. And that, that was my working title, if, if once you have slept on an island or you'll never be quite the same for quite a long time before I landed on the title that I have. Um, but I will leave it there and thank you so much for attending and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions if you guys uh, are curious about any of my, my process, my writing, Rachel Field or the whole, the whole big deal. Excellent, thanks so much, Robin. Sure. Um, like I said, um, um, people are welcome to uh, ask questions either via chat and I'll read them aloud or unmute and ask uh, Robin yourself. But uh, I'll start off with a question if it's all right. Sure. Um, um, but are there any fun stories that you found um, that didn't get included in the book that you'd like to share? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, oh gosh, there were so many things she, um, I think most of it got into the book, but she, she had a visit to J.M. Barry when she traveled to London one time, which I really loved. Um, and uh, that might be in the book. I, I can't think of any in particular. Most of my favorite stories I, I made a point of including. Um, so in terms of things I left out, um, yeah, not, nothing leaps to mind beyond that. Like, you know, a lot. She did some more world travels that that didn't come into here that I that I liked quite a lot. Um, and uh, and she wrote a lot of humorous poetry, like um, satire. Um, you know, uh, what do you call the the little epigrams that are on people's gravestones and things like that. So she she had sessions with fellow writers and, and wrote you know, lo lots of um, sort of tongue in cheek stuff. She had, a, she had a, quite a sense of humor too and I couldn't include all that in there either. So um, I guess that, that's what I would say. Excellent, I think I, think I saw Betsy raised a hand in the, uh, in, the, in the chat. So go ahead, Betsy, if you have a question. You might need to un unmute yourself, Betsy. Did I do it? There you go. <laughs> now I can hear you. I was going all over the place. I was wondering if her books of poetry are still available. Um, they're they're not still in print, but I over over time I have been able to collect quite a few of them. This you know here's here's one called Taxis and Toadstool Stools. She wrote Branches Green, Fear is the Thorn. Eliza and the Elves. Then there's a there's a collection of books. It's just called 
poems um, that's, that spans her whole career that was published after her death. And I, you can find them if you just browse around online, but, um, but it can be tough. And some people told me that you know, some of her books are in the hundreds of dollars because they're considered collector's items now. But I, the ones I found were, were reasonably priced, you know, 20 bucks or something like that. So uh, sadly, it's the, uh, that's the only way I think you can find her stuff now is finding old collections and um, seeing if people are parting with them on, on the internet somewhere. Um, and maybe, maybe the book will inspire some publishing company to re-release Rachel Field's work. Uh, <laughs> or do an anthology for poetry. That would be lovely. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. Well, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, this is Dorothea Guthrie speaking. Hi, Dorothea. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, good. My question is about Hitty because um, I loved Hitty as a child and and that's my entree into Rachel Field. And I'm just wondering, what, what is the story of Hitty? What place did Hitty have in Rachel Field's life? And, oh, and God. the fact that there's an actual doll that sat on your mantelpiece. Yeah, well, that she, she tells a very um, thorough story, which I, which I recount in the book. It's been printed in doll magazines and things that she and uh, Dorothy Lathrop um, independent of each other had passed the same um, antique shop window and had seen this same doll. And they said, oh my gosh, they couldn't believe that they both had noticed this tiny little wooden doll in the, in the window of a shop in New York City. And, um, and they, they started talking about how expensive she was and too expensive to buy, but then they bought her together, the two of them. And they brought her to Sutton Island and sat her in a little settee, a little wooden settee on the mantelpiece in, in the, this house on Sutton Island, which I call the field house now, or it was, it's been called the field house for many decades before I got there. Um, and that's where they brainstormed all their Hitty stories. Um, and in the next year, Rachel wrote the whole story, but Hitty became a personage in, in and of herself. Joe Titzel was a writer who was friends with Rachel and he wrote about, carrying Hitty in his breast pocket to go to the theater um, <laughs> on a theater outing in New York City. And Hitty and Rachel both, um, as one part of the leg of their journey to California to accept the Newbery Award, they had their first flight on an airplane. So Rachel and Hitty both flew on an airplane for the first time. And there's a magazine, there's a magazine cover with a picture of little Hitty in this biplane on, as the big cover photo on this magazine. So, I mean, um, it was really very interesting. Hitty, um, Hitty became a celebrity herself. And in fact, one of, you know, part of my momentum in my early research was that there were, there were so many Hitty fans in the, all around the country and they came to a huge Hitty conference in Stockbridge. And there was another Hitty event on Cranberry Island and, um, so, so Hitty, I should, I should be giving her a lot of credit for this whole thing too. Well, Hitty confirmed my own belief that all my dolls had lives of their own. Ha! Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can imagine that. Yeah, she, she struck a chord with so many people. Um, I've heard from many, many people that who that that was the first thing they associated with Rachel Field was, um, oh my gosh. I remember Hitty so well as a child and she loved that book so much. And yeah, that, that, was, a, that was a very, very big deal book. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, question in the chat, let's see, Jean says, um, what are your thoughts about Hitty becoming um, somewhat controversial these days, considered more politically incorrect? Oh yeah, I I um, well I I can understand. Well, I, I'm glad the book still exists, but I I know there's a re-release of Hitty written by Rosemary Wells, maybe in the 70s or 80s, um, because in the in the Hitty book, like many old books, there's racist language used, there's in, inappropriate, um, uh, demeaning language about about uh, the black races and things like that. And so um, 
people don't like to promote that language anymore. And so Rosemary Wells' solution to that was to do a re-release of Hitty, add some more contemporary American history stories into Hitty's life and take out that those controversial sections. And um, and that, that that's a nice book in its own right. I, I too love the original Hitty. Um, and I, I, I don't, I think it's worth reading old books, even if they like, you know, like Huck Finn, I, I think it's worth reading old books um, it, in the full acknowledgement of how our times have changed and how, you know, we, we have changed what's acceptable language in today's day and age, but as a, in its historical context, um, I think it's still worth, worth valuing those books. Does that answer the question that you were wondering about? Uh, any last questions? Uh, I want to wrap up with uh, what are you working on now? What uh, what's stuff next for you, Robin? Um, I I I've hardly had a minute to sit down and focus on writing, but um, I there there's uh, many things in my mind. I I have one of the interims in my writing project of the Rachel Field book. I took almost a full year, maybe a year and a half off and, and wrote an, an entire book, um, which was more purely memoir. And it addresses end of life, um, how we die in the United States and some of the problems with the way death um, is treated in our country. Uh, it's, it's mostly a memoir about uh, the mother-daughter relationship in my own mother's end of uh, last few weeks of life. But I also do do a fair amount of research and talk about how we could do better with uh, with end of life in this country. So I, I'd like to pull that manuscript manuscript back out and see if it's something I'd like to try to publish. Um, but I also have been working a lot of my own poetry. I'd like to put out a poetry collection myself sometime. So so that's sort of the the lighthearted side and the you know death and poetry back and forth. So uh, that might be what I do is to um, work on those two projects at the same time. Fascinating, thanks so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, I'll put out a last call for questions and then I think we'll get wrapping up. Any last questions? I'll just say you got, I, I welcome, um, I welcome people on my website at any time, and it, there's a, a way to contact me there. If you're interested in getting a newsletter from me, I'm happy to add you to my mailing list. Um, and I, I'm very grateful for all of you to join me this evening, and um, best, best to all of you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, and thanks thank so much. you Robin. very much. And thank you. Thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to Robin for a really beautiful and fascinating talk and uh, have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you.